Wherever in the world people take to the streets for their liberation from exploitation and oppression, wherever revolutionaries demonstrate or organize events, they invoke Lenin. His books are among the most widely read worldwide. Although the concrete social reality has changed in the past hundred years, they still give a fundamental orientation for everyone searching for a societal alternative to capitalism. For the world proletariat, Lenin paved the way for a socialist world without capitalist exploitation and oppression of the masses. St. Petersburg, called Petrograd, Russia's capital in those years. It is 25 October 1917, according to the old Russian calendar. All strategically significant points are occupied by the Red Guards. 9.45 p.m. Cannons roar. The guns of the cruiser Aurora are trained on the Winter Palace. The last fortress of the bourgeois Kerensky government falls when soldiers and Red Guards storm the seat of the government, the Winter Palace. The October Revolution introduces a new era in human history. It marks the beginning of the general crisis of capitalism and the transition to socialism. Three years earlier, in 1914, the First World War had broken out. All then imperialist countries, old as well as newly emerging ones, participated in it. Entire generations of young men bled to death in the trenches and were blinded in attacks with poison gas. The civilian population was starving. In the backward Russian Tsarist Empire, misery was particularly widespread. Peasants had been drafted into the army in masses. Their families were starving. Weapons and food were lacking at the front. Behind the rotting facade of the corrupt, feudal Tsarist regime, capitalism had rapidly developed. Russia was an imperialist power and a bulwark of reaction. The Tsarist realm united capitalist imperialism with pre-capitalist production relations. It was the weakest link in the chain of the imperialist world system. With the development of capitalism, the class of wage workers had appeared, which, though still relatively small, would become the decisive force of the Russian Revolution under the revolutionary leadership of the Bolsheviks. The still young working class had already gained experience in revolutionary struggles. In 1905 there had been strikes, mass struggles and a revolution which ended in defeat. Persecution, oppression, confusion and disappointment spread. Many were banished to Siberia or had to flee like Lenin. But the social contradictions intensified further. The common goal of all progressive social forces first had to be the democratic revolution against Tsarist rule with its power apparatus and sophisticated system of informers. The year 1917 begins with mass strikes, hunger demonstrations and peasant uprisings. On 23 February, according to our calendar the 8th of March, the women workers of the cotton spinning mill in the Petersburg industrial area, Viborg, give the signal. They leave their machines, move in the direction of the city center and call on the workforce of other factories to join. On this day, 50,000 march in the streets. Peace, bread, land are their slogans. The Tsarist regime has Cossacks fire into the crowds. They cause a bloodbath. The 
But no longer do they all follow orders. First army units mutiny. The funeral of the 1,300 victims of this massacre becomes a powerful mass demonstration. 900,000 mourners march through the snow-covered streets. Again and again, the hymn of the French Revolution, the Marseillaise, and the Internationale are sung. With the February Revolution, the Tsar was driven from his throne. A dual power emerged in Russia. On one side the provisional bourgeois government, with Kerensky at the head. His government hardly touched the old Tsarist state apparatus, its army, police and courts. On the other side were the democratically elected councils of the workers and soldiers, called Soviets in the Russian language. They were composed of various groups of workers and soldiers. At that time the followers of Lenin and the Soviets were still in the minority. From his Swiss exile, Lenin followed the revolutionary developments in Russia most intensely and provided leadership through newspapers and letters. In the beginning of April, he was able to cross Germany in a sealed train and return to Russia. Enthusiastic masses of people welcomed him at Finland station, the northernmost train station of the capital. In hastily convened gatherings, Lenin addressed the most urgent issues. Articles were written, mass discussions organized. For Lenin, it was clear. Only the socialist revolution will fundamentally change the power and property relations and put an end to the capitalist exploitation of human beings by human beings. He characterized The specific feature of the present situation in Russia in April 1917 as passing from the first stage of the revolution, which, owing to the insufficient class consciousness and organization of the proletariat, placed power in the hands of the bourgeoisie to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants. The democratic revolution could only be the preliminary stage for the continuation of the proletarian revolution to socialism. It is necessary in order to achieve democratic rights and liberties. Political prisoners and banished persons are freed, Parties can operate in the open, newspapers can be distributed. Without such possibilities, the proletariat is not able to train, harden, educate and organize itself in the struggle. For the Bolsheviks, the most important thing was now to win over the decisive majority of the working class and to include the broad masses in their struggle against the Kerensky government. For within just a few weeks, it bitterly disappointed the hopes of the masses. Contrary to all promises, it continued the hated war. In the interest of the big landowners, it refused to carry out the land reform urgently demanded by the peasants. For a time, the provisional government was able to spread confusion and disorientation, but it could not stop the flood of the revolutionary movement. Again, strikes, mass demonstrations and peasant uprisings flared up. From July until October 1917, 3.5 million workers participated in strikes. In September and October alone, 2.4 million. The strikes became politicized and revolutionized. From March until June 1917, 2,944 militant actions of the peasants were counted. With 3,500 peasant revolts in September and October, they actually grew to become a real peasant war against the landowners and the government. In April, Lenin proclaimed the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. With systematic persuasion work, based on principles, the Bolsheviks under the leadership of Lenin succeeded in winning over the decisive majority of the proletariat and forging an alliance with the poor peasants. At the Petrograd Conference of Factory Committees in June 1917, 75% joined the Bolsheviks. 
In September 1917, the majority of the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets had changed over to the side of the Bolsheviks. At the end of 1916, the Bolsheviks had 1,500 to 2,000 members in Petrograd. In July 1917, it was already 240,000. From August 1917, in the heavy surging of the societal confrontations, a decisive battle neared. The masses no longer wanted and could not continue to live in the old way. Those in power could no longer rule in the old way. This indicates a revolutionary situation. The question of power had to be solved. Lenin had finished his work, The State and Revolution, two months previously. In it, he set out the fundamental viewpoint of Marx and Engels on the role of the state and developed it further for the situation on the eve of the revolution. Only if the bourgeois state is smashed can a new society be built up which is free of the power structures, the apparatus of violence, the bureaucracy and the practices of the capitalist class. This makes the dictatorship of the proletariat necessary. Then, as now, it is the nightmare of the bourgeois world and the subject of anti-communist hatred. In this revolutionary situation, Lenin determined the progressive role it has in building socialism. The state is a special organization of force. It is an organization of violence for the suppression of some class. What class must the proletariat suppress? Naturally, only the exploiting class, the bourgeoisie. Only in this way can the transition to a classless society be organized. So Lenin continues. We set ourselves the ultimate aim of abolishing the state. All organized and systematic violence. All use of violence against people in general. In striving for socialism, however, we are convinced that it will develop into communism and, therefore, that the need for violence against people in general for the subordination of one man to another and of one section of the population to another will vanish altogether since people will come accustomed to observing the elementary conditions of social life without violence and without subordination. When the forces for the preparation of the proletarian revolution became stronger, the Kerensky government went over to massive oppression of the revolutionaries. Lenin was to be put on trial. For a time he had to go into hiding again in the near Finland. Disguised as a fireman, at the beginning of October he was smuggled back across the border by the Finnish train driver Jalava. In Petersburg attention now focused directly on preparing the armed insurrection. The masses are more and more determined to take their destiny in their own hands. Soldiers desert in massive numbers and join the revolution. Lenin learns that the Kerensky government plans to secretly send troops from the front to Petersburg in order to defeat the revolutionary movement. He warns, To delay action is fatal. In the Smolny, the headquarters of the revolutionaries, with Lenin at the head, Red Guards and revolutionary soldiers are mustered. They already move out during the night to carry out the carefully prepared plans to occupy the telephone and radio stations, the bridges across the Neva and the railway stations. In the morning of October 25th, all strategically important institutions of the capital are in the hands of the insurgent proletariat. Kerensky has fled, his ministers have been arrested. The armed insurrection has prevailed. At 10 a.m. in the morning, the Revolutionary Military Committee issued the historical call written by Lenin to the citizens of Russia. The provisional government has been deposed. State power has passed into the hands of the organ of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers' Deputies, the Revolutionary Military Committee which heads the Petrograd proletariat and the garrison. The cause for which the people have fought, namely, the immediate offer of a democratic peace, 
the abolition of landed proprietorship, workers' control over production, and the establishment of Soviet power. This cause has been secured. Long live the revolution of workers, soldiers and peasants. On the following day, the second All-Russia Congress of Soviets elected the Council of People's Commissars, chaired by Lenin, as revolutionary government. In rapid succession, laws and decrees were issued on the nationalization of banks, workers' control, the separation of church and state, the introduction of the eight-hour workday, the ban of child labor, equality of nationalities, the repeal of feudal marriage and family laws, maternity rights, repeal of the ban of abortion and homosexuality, for the ban of domestic violence against children as well, and so forth. But first of all, the revolutionary government promulgated decrees on land and peace. For the First World War was still raging. The Russian revolutionaries now made peace proposals to all belligerent countries. This gave rise to great hopes also among the war very masses in the countries involved in the war. However, the warring imperialist parties boycotted the peace proposals. They centered the opportunity to advance further against the weakened enemy and crush the revolution. In order to rescue the revolution in the face of a superior enemy, at the beginning of 1918, in the peace treaty of Brest-Litovsk, the revolutionary government had to make painful concessions involving great losses of territory to imperialist Germany. Lenin broke with the dogma of various social democratic parties of the Second International that a socialist country was only possible, only permitted after the capitalist productive forces in a country had completely matured and the proletariat constituted the absolute majority of the population there. On the basis of this dogma, the Mensheviks defamed the October Revolution as a putsch. However, the October Revolution was the work of the masses, borne by the struggle of hundreds of thousands and supported by millions of people, especially workers, peasants and soldiers. The Bolsheviks had firm trust in their revolutionary will and gave them leadership and orientation. It was Lenin's brilliant leadership that allowed this power to unfold. Willy Dikut, leading thinker and co-founder of the MLPD, wrote about Lenin's leadership of the revolution. Lenin discarded abstract formulas. His tactics were flexible, bold and full of risks. The October Revolution 1917 was also a great risk, especially because the plan for the insurrection had been disclosed shortly before by Zinoviev and Kamenev. In spite of this, Lenin did not fear the risk because he perceptively recognized that the armed insurrection was inevitable and would be victorious based on the balances of forces. Lenin's ability to quickly grasp the nearing events in their inner development, his sharp eye for recognizing what had to be done, made him become the ingenious organizer of the proletarian revolution. How was this success possible? Lenin was born on April 22, 1870, as Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov in Simbirsk, a city on the banks of the Volga. His parents were determined opponents of the mass misery caused by the big feudal landowners, of the lack of the rights and ignorance with which the peasants, who often still were serfs, were oppressed by the church and state. The hatred for Tsarism grew when the oldest son, Alexander, was arrested and condemned to death. He had participated with an anarchist group in an assassination attempt against the Tsar's family. The death of his beloved brother deeply stirred Lenin, who was 17 then. He understood his deed. He had to act in this way. He could do nothing else. 
but he also said, you have to go a different way. As a pupil, Lenin already studied contemporary revolutionary writings of the times, especially Capital by Karl Marx, which had just been translated into Russian. He came to understand that because of its position in production and society, the working class is the only unsparingly revolutionary force, even though in terms of numbers, it still was a minority in Russia. So he moved to the industrial center of the country, to St. Petersburg. There he became active, uniting some 20 existing small worker circles to form the League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class. There he met Nadezhda Krupskaya, who was also active in the revolutionary working class movement and who he later married. Both were sentenced to prison and banned to Siberia for their work and had to spend many years in exile. As a proletarian internationalist, Lenin abided by the principle of organizing himself in the revolutionary party of the countries in which he lived as a political refugee. He thus was a party member in Switzerland for a time and in Germany in the then revolutionary Social Democratic Party, SPD. He devoted particular attention to party building in Russia. In 1898, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, RSDLP, was founded. At its second party congress in 1903, there was a fundamental dispute over party building. The opportunist line was directed against the leading role of the working class and advocated an alliance with bourgeois and petty bourgeois intelligentsia and the rising capitalist class. The opportunists maintained that the working class first had to form the numerical majority in society before the socialist revolution could be conducted. Lenin opposed this. Even if the working class in a country is still in the numerical minority, it must and can take over the leadership in the revolutionary struggle. The most important ally in Russia had to be the poor population in the countryside, the agricultural laborers and the small and middle peasants. The opportunist economists also advocated restriking the workers to economic struggles for improving their working and living conditions. That was worship of the spontaneity of the working class movement and meant subjugation to the existing social relations and renunciation of the revolutionary struggle. Lenin exposed the economists as reformists, an instrument of bourgeois influence on the working class. The majority, the Bolsheviks, followed Lenin at the Second Party Congress. The minority, the Mensheviks, adhered to the opportunist positions. In this controversy, Lenin purposefully developed the concept of the Revolutionary Working Class Party as a party of struggle. That included the plan for building up such a party in the entire country. With the help of the newspaper he founded, which appeared as a central organ, all revolutionaries in every corner of the country could be reached by secret paths. A firm organization could be built up around the newspaper. In his writing of 1902, What is to be done? Lenin emphasized the decisive importance of the unity of theory and practice and the outstanding role of creative theoretical work. Without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement and the role of vanguard fighter can be fulfilled only by a party that is guided by the most advanced theory. Regarding the defeat of the Russian Revolution of 1905, Lenin soberly observed, the objective and subjective conditions for the victory of the revolution had not yet matured. The revolution was brutally crushed. The Stolypin reaction, named after the Tsar's Prime Minister, raged. 5,500 revolutionaries were executed under martial law. Many others were banished to Siberia or had to flee the country. 
a mood of defeat and confusion spread among the Mensheviks. This went as far as liquidationism, which means the active destruction of the party and to the defamation of its leaders. Stalwart party members were denounced from within the party's own ranks and delivered to death. The party lost almost 80% of its members. Especially intellectuals left the party, while the most steadfast workers formed the backbone of further party building. What was the underlying cause of this? Tremendous advances were made in industrial production and the natural sciences during that period. Path-breaking scientific discoveries became known, like X-rays and radioactivity. This was a material basis of the philosophical disputes of the time, even within the ranks of the revolutionary movement. A flood of positivist theories, capable of grasping single manifestations, but not connections and interactions, were spread. Empirio criticism is the attempt to reconcile materialism and idealism. It maintains that whereas the world exists objectively, human beings are not able to comprehend nor even less change it. Alleged Marxists used this to justify their capitulation and become advocates of the reconciliation with capitalism. As an ideological polemic against this liquidationism, Lenin's main philosophical work, Materialism and Imperial Criticism, appeared in 1909. In it, Lenin defended dialectical and historical materialism and developed it further. In the theory of knowledge, as in every other branch of science, we must think dialectically, that is, we must not regard our knowledge as ready-made and unalterable, but must determine how knowledge emerges from ignorance, how incomplete, inexact knowledge becomes more complete and more exact. This was also his approach to investigating the considerable upheavals in the world, such as the development of new imperialist countries. This allowed him to develop the correct strategy and tactics for the party. The liquidation of liquidationism was the prerequisite for a new upswing of revolution. In addition, there were repeated sharp disputes with Leo Trotsky about the character of the party. To put Trotsky's idea into practice would have destroyed the revolutionary character of the party. He demanded that different tendencies, even opposing factions, be allowed within the party and actively participated in building these up. This was rejected by an overwhelming majority in the party, whereupon he built up covert factions and tried to split the party. In order to clearly distinguish themselves from the Mensheviks, the Bolsheviks then named themselves Communist Party. In the 1920s, among the Communist parties, the principles developed by Lenin for parties gained acceptance worldwide. Work on the basis of a clear ideological political line. Organizational principle of democratic centralism, which unites the democratic initiative of all party members with the unified practice of the party. Political activity of every party member instead of a mass of mostly passive or only paying members. A party of struggle, not an election party. Concentration on the factories and winning of the decisive majority of the working class as leading force of the revolution. Collective analysis and decision making on party policy, systematic implementation and its control as opposed to a style of wordy resolutions without struggling resolutely for their implementation. Collective leadership bodies, which are accountable for their work and have clearly determined tasks. On the central level, this was especially the central committee. The old social democracy was dominated by individual leading personalities who were not accountable to anyone. To this day, Lenin's principles are the basis and measure for the construction of a Marxist-Leninist party and are also applied by the MLPD and constantly further developed. 
the Marxist-Leninist party develops as a living organism in stages and periods of party building. With every essential change in class struggle, it must develop further and change itself. In his unshakable internationalism, Lenin followed the founders of Marxism, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. In the last years of his life, at the end of the 19th century, Engels saw the threat of a world war among the capitalist countries approaching. Joint internationalist decisions repeatedly were fought through at conferences of the Second Socialist International, which he had participated in founding. All party leaderships committed themselves to upholding that no worker should fire at his class brothers in other countries. However, 20 years after Engels' death, when the First World War broke out in August 1914, almost all of these leaders betrayed class solidarity. They degenerated into defenders of the fatherland and made truces with their respective belligerent rulers. This was also the case in Germany, with the betrayal by the formerly revolutionary Social Democratic Party. The Second International wretchedly capitulated and Lenin's party left it. Lenin fought resolutely to unite the internationalist forces of the parties under the slogan War Against Imperialist War. At first, only a few followed. Meanwhile, millions of soldiers were bleeding to death in the trenches. The initial war enthusiasm was quickly fading. The development of the murderous war and the capitulation of the social democratic leaders of the Second International had deeper causes. Lenin searched for their roots in society and class struggle. In 1916, in his Swiss exile, he elaborated his writing, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. He analyzed imperialism as new and highest stage of capitalism and eve of the proletarian revolution. Lenin characterized the essential prerequisites for its development. Monopolies develop which attain a dominant position in economic life. Industrial and bank capital merge to create dominating finance capital. Capital export, as distinguished from the export of commodities, attains a dominant position in economy. International capitalist monopoly associations begin to develop, which divide the world among themselves. The territorial division of the world among the biggest imperialist powers has been completed. Lenin established, imperialism means everywhere reaction internally, striving for world power and aggression externally. He exposed the law-governed route of imperialist wars. The uneven distribution of the railways, their uneven development, sums up, as it were, modern monopolist capitalism on a worldwide scale. And this summary proves that imperialist wars are absolutely inevitable under such an economic system as long as private property in the means of production exists. The general laws are valid as long as imperialism exists, but the changes in imperialism must constantly be examined by the Marxist-Leninists. Lenin described imperialism as decaying, parasitic capitalism. Today, that is more apparent than ever. At the same time, with imperialism, the material preparation for the United Socialist States of the world has developed more and more universally. This includes the forces for overcoming it. An international industrial proletariat in alliance with all the oppressed of the world. Under the condition of the reorganization of international production, the socialist revolution will take on an international character. The fundamental contradiction of our epoch between capitalism and socialism 
necessitates a solution. Lenin drew revolutionary conclusions from his analysis. Thus, out of the universal ruin caused by the war a worldwide revolutionary crisis is arising which, however prolonged and arduous its stages may be, cannot end otherwise than in a proletarian revolution and in its victory. Lenin assumed that a successful revolution would expand from the weakest link of the chain, Russia, in a chain reaction to Western Europe. Actually, revolutionary struggles did develop in many countries of Western Europe and Asia. However, without clear leadership, they were split and could be stifled in blood. The 1918 November Revolution in Germany sent the Kaiser packing. It ended the war for Germany and brought democratic rights, like women's suffrage. However, the revolutionary workers had just begun to free themselves fully from the harmful influence of the class collaboration by the SPD leaders. The revolutionary communist party, KPD, had only just been founded at the turn of 1919 and was still ideologically, politically and organizationally weak. The revolutionary leaders of the KPD, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, who were well recognized by the class-conscious workers, were assassinated by reactionary Freikorps troops at the beginning of January 1919, and the revolutionary uprising was smashed. Accomplice of the counter-revolution was the corrupt SPD leadership, which first established itself in the government under Friedrich Ebert. Instead of socialism, capitalism prevailed in Germany. Lenin remained undaunted and emphasized. The first victory is not yet the final victory, and it was achieved by our October Revolution at the price of incredible difficulties and hardships, at the price of unprecedented suffering, accompanied by a series of serious reverses and mistakes on our part. We have made the start. When, at what date, and time, and the proletarians of which nation will complete this process, is not important. The important thing is that the ice has been broken, the road is open, the way has been shown. On the initiative of Lenin, the Communist International was founded in March 1919. It organized international solidarity with revolutionary Russia and support for the construction of new revolutionary working class parties. The October Revolution became the inspiration for communist and working class parties all over the world. After the victory of the October Revolution, the capitalist rulers, rivals in the imperialist war until then, joined forces. They wanted to destroy the first socialist country of the world and bring the old exploiters back to power. To this end, the imperialist powers USA, France, Britain and Japan agreed to launch a military invasion in 1918 without prior warning. They made use of the fact that while the proletarian revolution had overthrown the bourgeois government, large parts of the Tsarist empire were still under the rule of feudal princes. Until 1922, 14 states participated in this crime. They were supported by all domestic reactionaries, called the Whites, and temporarily occupied large parts of the country. The white terror caused immense destruction, starvation, misery and millions of deaths. The anti-communist terror gangs left a trail of blood behind them. The civil war for the protection of the victory of the October Revolution and the defense of the young Soviet power against the imperialist intervention raged for four years. Again, Lenin understood how to develop strategy and tactics with the highest level of flexibility and farsightedness. Men and women, young and old, who wanted no return to the old relations of exploitation, 
fought even in the farthest regions of the country. And so the civil war became the acid test, welding together the revolutionary workers, peasants and soldiers to accomplish great things. Bourgeois historians attribute the millions of deaths in this defensive war to Lenin's reign of terror. According to their infamous anti-communist logic, had it not been for the October Revolution, the war of intervention would not have happened. And so they try at the same time to justify their bloody counter-revolution. Heroically and with great sacrifices, the Soviet masses gained victory in hard struggle. Now they could tackle the construction of socialism comprehensively. Based on the experiences of the Paris Commune and the Soviet Council system, the victory of the new type of state of the dictatorship of the proletariat was secured. Everyone charged with tasks in the party, state and economy was accountable and could be voted out of office. With delegate congresses and broad debates, the most comprehensive democracy for the masses came into being. The famous words that every cook must learn to govern the state come from Lenin. Step by step, a total of 16 nations, including about 60 different peoples, united on a voluntary basis to form the Union of Soviet Republics, the Soviet Union. Fundamental workers' rights, at that time not even approximately realized in any capitalist country, like the eight-hour day, were introduced. Campaigns against illiteracy or for the construction of a health system reached even the remotest village. The electrification of the whole country on the basis of the unity of humanity and nature and the harnessing of natural sources of energy was advanced. The struggle for the liberation of women against the legacy of the bourgeois and feudal family policies and morals was continued, especially in the struggle against the influence of the church. The economy, weakened by the war and civil war, had first to get off the ground again. With unprecedented commitment, the workers rebuilt their country. They made the young Soviet Union one of the most productive national economies of the world. To achieve this, temporary compromises with the help of the new economic policy NEP were unavoidable. Incentives were provided for the peasants to produce more than for their immediate needs. Smaller capitalist enterprises got leeway. Foreign corporations were granted licenses for the extraction of raw materials. The dictatorship of the proletariat guaranteed that these concessions could be kept in check and would speed the transition to socialist construction. The dictatorship of the proletariat provides unprecedented liberty, democracy and self-determination for the masses. It secures liberty and democracy for the masses by suppressing the capitalist exploiters, warmongers and counter-revolutionaries. The program of the MLPD therefore orients towards the future, stating After the working class has overthrown the dictatorship of international finance capital and taken over state power in the individual countries, it must set up the dictatorship of the proletariat and transform the means of production into common property of the entire working population. This revolutionary transformation can be achieved only by the conscious mass action of the working class and its allies, and never by the bare decrees of the authorities of socialist society. Within the CPSU, struggles broke out of the further path in the construction of socialism. There was a bitter confrontation with Leo Trotsky. In the revolutionary upswing of the October Revolution, he again came closer to the Bolsheviks and temporarily took on important tasks. However, he capitulated in the face of the enormous challenge of beginning with the construction of socialism in one country. He resisted the peace of Brest-Litovsk, which had been absolutely necessary to secure the revolution. He cowardly ran away and worked with all means against the construction of socialism in one country. 
in a demagogic way, he covered up his capitulation with left phrases of his concept of permanent revolution. This was supposed to first take place, if at all, in more developed countries. In order to justify his betrayal, he mutated into a bitter enemy of socialist construction. His supporters organized acts of sabotage and assassinations in the country. His slander against Lenin, and mainly against Stalin, knew no bounds. He did not even stop short of cooperating with Hitlerite fascists. For the masses, especially the peasants, he had only arrogant contempts. In contrast, Lenin's trust in the masses was unshakable. He recognized and promoted forward-looking initiatives among the class-conscious workers and especially the youth. Exemplary for this was the Sabatnik movement, regarding which Lenin emphasized. Communism begins when the rank-and-file workers display enthusiastic concern that is undaunted by arduous toil to increase the productivity of labor, which do not accrue to the workers personally or to their close kith and kin, but to their distant kith and kin, to society as a whole, to tens and hundreds of millions of people united first in one socialist state and then in a union of Soviet republics. The young socialist Soviet Union developed an enormous attraction as an alternative model of society of its time. The enthusiasm took hold of artists, writers, scientists, technicians and engineers and, not least of all, workers around the globe. Teams of architects under the German architect Ernst May and the American John Scott developed plans for the gigantic steel city Magnitogorsk. The Austrian Margarete Schütte-Lihotsky constructed light-flooded kindergartens and workers' clubs. International artists helped design the Moscow Metro. Young skilled workers from all countries helped in the construction of the world's first socialist country. In 1928, one of them was Willy Dickut. In all the fundamental aspects of political economy, philosophy and the doctrine of class struggle, Lenin raised Marxism to a new level. His closest comrade and successor in the leadership of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Josef Stalin, coined the term Leninism for Lenin's contribution to scientific socialism. Lenin is a classic of Marxism-Leninism. The Marxist-Leninist Party of Germany, MLPD, proudly carries Lenin in its name. The secret of the gigantic achievements lies in the complete mastery of the dialectical materialist method. Its essential feature is the fundamental unity of theory and practice. Contemporaries who listened to Lenin's speeches at mass rallies emphasize how this informed his impressive logic and his empathy for his audience. Marx and Engels established dialectical materialism as theory and method. With each epoch-making discovery, materialism has to change its form, Frederick Engels had demanded. That is what Lenin achieved. He planned to write a comprehensive book on dialectics, which he could not complete because of other priority tasks. With his critical study of the idealist dialectics of Hegel, in 1914, he drafted an outline for the structure of his planned work. He called this outline the Elements of Dialectics. Mao Zedong worked with this systematically, among other things in elaborating his lectures for the Red Army, on practice and on contradiction. Willy Dikut recognized the significance of the elements Lenin's definition of dialectics is excellently apt to make the essence of Marxism-Leninism understandable. His Elements of Dialectics provides an example of guidance on how to apply 
and further develop Marxism-Leninism at present. The MLPD made the conscious application of the dialectical method the fundamental method for the ideological, political and practical work of the party. It generalized the theoretical and practical experiences with this in the 1990s in the form of the doctrine of the mode of thinking and worked out a system of training for its conscious application. Lenin's close collaborator Yuri Larin describes vividly how the dialectical method became second nature to Lenin. This was manifested, last but not least, in the contact with comrades and workers who asked him daily for advice and help after the October Revolution. People here sometimes were surprised that Lenin devoted so much time and effort, sometimes a large part of the day, to the countless little everyday affairs requiring attention, the noodle soup as he called it. Whoever came to him with a single, often very minor problem, departed enriched with the ability to tackle the matter correctly. He taught the person to approach a fact from the reality of life, that is, to tackle things at the most important junctions, connecting them with other phenomena, without letting one's thoughts wander in all directions and not forgetting what is most important amid all the details. He taught the person to recognize in the least of things what is characteristic. He taught the person a matter-of-factness that does not let itself be seduced for lack of principles, to combine a cool mind with a passionate heart and, determined by the character of the work itself, to go about the matter at hand with an ardent fervor, without any superficiality. Lenin was a highly educated intellectual. He loved classical music and practiced a lively and critical exchange with artists and writers like Maxim Gorky. At the same time, he merged completely with the ordinary workers and peasants, listened to them, understood their way of life and thinking. In the same way as he treated them as equals and placed deep trust in them, they regarded their Ilyich, as they called him, as one of their own. Lenin was a team worker and had close collaborators like Stalin, Sverdlov, Kalinin, Krupskaya, Kaganovich, Molotov and others with whom he constantly consulted, critically and self-critically, as can be seen from numerous letters. He had a very close relationship of trust with Stalin. He entrusted him with far-reaching operational tasks, especially during the civil war and in the complicated nationality policy. Contemporaries emphasize Lenin's hardness and irreconcilability towards the enemies of the working class. However, He also had no inhibitions about expressing self-criticism and placed great trust even in comrades who made mistakes. Frankly acknowledging a mistake, ascertaining the reasons for it, analyzing the conditions that have led up to it and thrashing out the means of its rectification. That is the hallmark of a serious party. That is how it should perform its duties and how it should educate and train its class and then the masses. Clara Zetkin, who for some years cultivated an also critical friendship with Lenin, describes his style of life in the 1920s. But his private dwelling was of the utmost simplicity and unpretentiousness. I have been in more than one worker's home furnished much more richly than that of the all-powerful Muscovite dictator. I found Lenin's wife and sister at supper, which I was immediately and heartily asked to share. It was a simple meal, as the hard times demanded. Later, the sister tried to find something sweet for the guest of honor and discovered a small jar of preserves. It was well known that the peasants provided their Ilyich with gifts of white flour, bacon, eggs, fruit, etc. But it was also well known that nothing remained in Lenin's household. Everything found its way to the hospitals and children's homes. Lenin's family held strictly to the principle of not living better than the others. 
that is then the working masses. In August 1918, a woman anarchist attempted to assassinate Lenin. He was hit by two bullets in the shoulder and neck. He was never able to recover completely. Several strokes paralyzed his capacity for work. Nevertheless, during the last months of his life, he left a legacy of visionary impulses and critical remarks for socialist construction. Not least, his last work warned against a betrayal of socialism from the inside, like the writing How We Should Reorganize the Workers' and Peasants' Inspection, which appeared in 1923. On the 21st of January 1924, he died at the age of just 53. Whoever concerns themselves with the past, present and future of the liberation struggles cannot ignore Lenin. In the centenary of the October Revolution, his epoch-making personality reaches the headlines. Even many bourgeois journalists, historians and politicians cannot deny Lenin a certain respect. For instance, when the German magazine Stern has to acknowledge him as undisputed strategist and man without whom this revolution never would have ended so successfully. However, inflammatory pamphlets dominate like the Saturday essay of the newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung, stating that what started with a putsch led to one of the bloodiest tyrannies of history raised great, vain hopes. Tyranny, that was the Tsarist regime. Tyranny, that was the war of intervention of the imperialist powers immediately after the October Revolution. Tyranny was carried to extremes by Hitlerite fascism with its invasion of the Soviet Union, which claimed many million lives. This tyranny could only be broken by the broad masses, who out of deep conviction were ready to go down the path drawn out by Lenin. Willy Dikut underlined, We cannot appreciate Lenin greatly enough. By the way, what is a genius? the highest degree of creative talent. This can surely be said of Lenin. Whoever maintains the opposite does not know Lenin and underestimates the immense significance of Leninism for the struggle of the working class. Mm -hmm.